Okay, hi there, and uh, welcome to an economic revision video looking at the relationships between real incomes and subjective happiness. This debate has become more prominent in recent times as the UK, amongst other countries, has struggled to achieve growth momentum a decade on from the global financial crisis, uh, despite a period of historically low interest rates. Changes in our well-being may also have been affected by the impact of nearly a decade of fiscal austerity, including uh, real cuts in government spending and a series of tax increases. There's now widespread agreement that living standards cannot be assessed purely with reference to changes in real disposable incomes. A wider, more holistic range of measures is needed, and this is the sort of thing that well-being statistics try to capture, including... Uh, reported life satisfaction and happiness. This chart shows real household disposable incomes per capita from 1995 through to 2018. Uh, you'll see that per capita incomes grew quite strongly from 2000 through to 2007. The economy was doing particularly well then, but following the financial crisis, following the recession, we can see that they have struggled to improve in real terms. In fact, uh, from 2009, through to 2018, per capita incomes adjusted for inflation increased by only 3.1% shown by the data labels there. And for millions of people, real incomes after direct taxes and welfare benefits, well, they've gone down over the period. And this, of course, leads to a fall in real purchasing power, meaning that less can be spent on goods and services, uh, utility bills and other expenses, including rents, uh, mortgages, become much more difficult to afford. And this, uh, this, this drop in real incomes may help to explain the increase in household debt over recent times. So this chart uh, basically looks at the rate of growth of household spending per head and income per head. The thick grey line is the pre-downturn average over the previous period. It was about 2% per year. So in real terms, spending and incomes tend to rise by about 2% per year. Keep that figure in mind. But over the last 10 years... The annual average growth of both income and spending per head in real terms has certainly lagged, has fallen largely below that pre-downturn growth rate, suggesting, of course, a period of pretty flat, um, stagnant living standards in real terms, as measured just by this, this particular indicator. However, our focus in this session is on well-being. Well-being is increasingly being used by examiners in their questions. So well-being is a broader, wider measure of our welfare than simply uh, GDP or gross national income per capita. Uh, the UK has joined a, a, a large number of countries in looking at how traditional measures of progress, such as GDP, can be complemented by subjective measures to assess how people feel about their lives. Uh, okay, so well-being is wider. It does include income per head. It also includes subjective reported life satisfaction and happiness. The feeling that things done in life are worthwhile. Indicators of stress, vulnerability and anxiety. So we're starting to build mental health indicators into our well-being assessment. Uh, people look at the labour market, not just the rate of unemployment, but also people's expectations about unemployment going forward. Do they fear for their jobs? To an extent, are households indebted? What's the ratio of their debt to income? And also, of course, income inequality uh, is uh, important. Uh, the GD coefficient is just one way of measuring that. So what is subjective happiness? If it comes up in the exam, it refers to self-reported levels of happiness with one's own life, usually using questionnaires and samples. And uh, measuring this normally involves considering emotions rather than just asking about how many uh, you know, cars a family owns or how many properties or how many uh, what's their income per capita. Lots of factors affect happiness, personality, genetics, social influence. Do you have a, a large network of close friends? Um, income and wealth, yes, but as we'll see in a few minutes, relative income and relative wealth can be important. Your health, absence of chronic illness, for example, and also your ability to, ha to access and enjoy leisure time. Well, this is the UK data for the 2019 Global Happiness Study. 
Ipsos Mori ask people what makes people happy around the world. And this is the data for the UK, percentage of respondents. What comes out of the survey? Well, I suppose that personal health, relationships, living conditions, physical, mental well-being, a feeling of being in control of one's destiny are reported as being noticeably important. Income, yes, but not quite as important as perhaps standard economic theory would suggest. Personal wellbeing surveys ask people to evaluate on a scale of 0 to 10 how satisfied they are with their life overall, whether they feel they have meaning and purpose uh, in their lives and about their emotions, levels of happiness and anxiety. Now, this is the data since 2011 for the UK. And there has been a rise in reported high life satisfaction and happiness, although that figure actually dipped in 2019. I'll leave you to think why that might have happened. Uh, I suppose with the rise in happiness, the rise in reported life satisfaction should be expected. We've had a decade of relatively low inflation. Uh, mortgages have become cheaper to, to service. Unemployment has fallen to a 45-year low. Employment's at a record high. However, many people are in vulnerable relatively poorly paid jobs perhaps in the gig economy and there's also been a uh, an increase in working poverty a, a little evaluation point about the data here this data is designed to come from a representative sample of society in the uk but please bear in mind that well-being can vary for different groups in society interesting article from gavin kelly of the resolution foundation uh, back in december 2019 uh, in the uk where overall levels of well-being proved resilient during the crisis and rose in its aftermath, the position of exposed groups, the unemployed, disabled and least qualified, actually deteriorated. So the macro reported well-being can hide a lot underneath the surface. Um, a paper in 2008 by Narbe and Ratzel argued that the fear of future unemployment substantially reduces current life expectant, uh, life uh, satisfaction. This chart here shows on the on the uh, on the right hand scale the rate of unemployment in blue. Of course, that's been falling quite substantially since 2011, and it's now at around four percent. That has been uh, consistent with a fall in unemployment expectations follow the yellow or the orange line there although more recently just in the last two or three years uh, people's sort of expectations of unemployment have started to go up perhaps a little bit of job insecurity uh, coming back into the into the economy which might impact on measured life satisfaction uh, this is a chart again from the happiness survey i mentioned earlier a uh, share of respondents who agree with the statement i am happy in 2019 and it turns out that the millennials have the highest strong agreement, followed by Generation Z, then the baby boomers, then Generation X. The baby boomers are people born between 1946 and about 1965, the post-war World War II baby boom. Generation X, typically born from the mid-1960s to the late 1970s. So they would be in their whatever, you know, <laughs> early 50s now, if you like. Uh, that's me. Millennials, uh, typically people who are born in the period from about the early 1980s to the mid 1990s. So those sort of people, if you're born in 1980, born in 1985, how old would you be now? You would be uh, 35 years old, wouldn't you? And Generation Z, typically people born between the mid 1990s to the mid 2000s. Uh, whenever you get a question on happiness, subjective happiness and well-being, it's quite important to at least mention an interesting bit of theory called the Easterlin Paradox. The Easterlin Paradox. Uh, this paradox, uh, and Richard Easterlin is, is pictured there, has persuaded uh, many policymakers in different countries to focus on well-being rather than a narrow conception of income and wealth. The Easterlin Paradox concerns whether we are happier and more contented as our incomes per capita go up. And Eastlin found that within a society, richer people tend to be happier than poor people. But he argued that life satisfaction only rises with incomes up to a certain point. And beyond that, um, and that may vary from different country to country, beyond that point, the marginal gain in happiness may decline. There could be diminishing returns to extra per capita income. One of the 
uh, Eastland's conclusions was that if we focus too much on absolute income, we tend to underestimate the importance of relative income. So my income relative to somebody else in my community, in my neighbourhood, that can have an impact on our reported life satisfaction. It can weigh heavily on people's minds. Uh, several papers have, uh, including a very famous 2008 paper by Betsy Stevenson and Justin Wolfers, have contested the findings of the East Indian paradox. Uh, Stevenson and Wolfers found that richer countries are happier and that wealthier people are, in fact, on average, happier. And they said there was no maximum wealth threshold after which happiness remains constant or even starts to fall. So it's a contested idea in economics, but definitely one that's worth mentioning. Uh, this is a chart from The Economist. If you click on I'll put a link in the, in the comments page of the video. Uh, but it basically shows the direction of travel for per capita income, GDP per person on the x-axis there, uh, purchasing power parity, and um, happiness, reported happiness. So it's the key thing here is the direction of travel. Uh, and you can see, uh, for example, in this situation, that the uh, uh, United States has actually uh, got a little little um, poorer and uh, and actually reported happiness is falling. In Venezuela, of course, with the collapse of the economy, there has been a huge dramatic fall in reported life satisfaction. And have a look at the link uh, on, the, uh, on the comments page if you want to go into the article into more detail. This is a chart, again, from the Gallup Survey, Global Emotions Report, the population that are most stressed in the world show the population experiencing a lot of stress. Uh, interestingly, Greece comes top of this figure, of course, a country that's been through the, the economic mill in the last 10 or 15 years. Eastland's uh, brought out a paper uh, in response to the Wolfers and Stevenson critique. His paper came out in 19, uh, 2017 and said that new data for both the United States and countries worldwide confirms that long term trends in growth rates of happiness and real GDP per capita are not significantly positively, positively related. So Eastland producing some new data suggesting that there isn't a clear, obvious, strong relationship between growth of per capita incomes and improvements in measured happiness. He thinks the Eastland paradox holds true. So there we go, a quick look through the economics of subjective happiness and the Eastern Limb paradox. The key takeaway points for me are that well-being is a much broader, wider conception of well-being and our living standards than just income per head. So be aware of some of the indicators and that uh, reported life satisfaction and the extent to which people are suffering from stress and anxiety is, I think, really important, particularly as we come to recognise the significance of mental health as a policy issue affecting households, communities, localities, and of course the economy as a whole. Okay, I hope you found that useful. Thanks for tuning in on this video.